Get the home field advantage every time with Fairfield by Marriott, official hotel partner of the NCAA. Whether you're a student athlete working toward your championship dreams or your team's biggest fan, Fairfield by Marriott has everything you need to get ready for game day. From comfortable guest rooms to complimentary hot breakfast, Fairfield is part of the Marriott Bonvoy portfolio of hotels and official hotel partner of the NCAA. Visit fairfield.marriott.com to book your next game day stay. It's easy to build credit with a Chime Secured Credit Builder Visa Credit Card. Use it everywhere Visa credit cards are accepted. To apply, just open a Chime checking account with a qualifying direct deposit. There's no annual fee or credit check required. Get started at Chime.com slash build. The Chime Credit Builder Visa Credit Card is issued by Stride Bank NA member FDIC. Chime checking account and 200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply. Out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. Call 1-844-244-6363 for details. On-time payment history may have a positive impact on your credit score. Late payment may negatively impact your credit score. Results may vary. Welcome into The Verge, a show which covers the Baltimore Orioles minor leagues. The Verge is part of BSL Radio. Baltimore Sports and Life is dedicated to analysis and discussion on the Orioles, Baltimore Ravens, and the University of Maryland. The site has a team of writers providing coverage of those teams and houses live streaming content weekly. Join the conversations at the message board, like BSL on Facebook, and follow BSL on Twitter. On Twitter. On Twitter. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we feel like having options like video podcasts and Q&A lets us be more creative on another level. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Hello, and thank you for listening to this week's Major League Mailbag. I'm your host, Bob Fallon, and I'm taking your questions about the Orioles Major League season and how things are going so far. I was supposed to do this last week. I lost power the day I was planning to uh, record. Unfortunately, you know, I planned to record as late as possible and then lost power, so just pushed everything back a week. So I'll take last week's questions as well as the new ones that we received for this week, and I'll get right to it with uh, Ben Dorse questions. He's got many, many questions. What do you do? when Austin Voth is ready to return from the IL. And I'm just going to take a look at who's currently on the Major League pitching staff outside of the six starters. You have Felix Bautista, not going anywhere. Yanir Cano, not going anywhere. Fujinami, not going anywhere. Then you have Jacob Webb, who was just claimed and has been off to a fantastic start. Six strikeouts and three hitless, scoreless innings with only one walk. You have Mike Bauman, who I feel like has earned his spot, but he does have an option if Cianel Perez, who's been pitching better, doesn't have an option, but isn't lights out. And you also have Deal Hall and John Means coming, which we'll get to. And you have Nick Vespi, who is a man <laughs> who has been optioned more than Stephen King books at this point. So I would imagine both. Does he, he's starting today. This is Sunday, August 13th, when I'm recording this. He's starting for AAA today. We shall see how it goes. If he's looking good, if he's the awesome vote Orioles had last year, he's a very he's a very good option to have for a multi-inning reliever or a spot starter down the stretch. This could be useful, but if he's also you know not 100% healthy or you know not having the success that he had last year or even after his rough start to this year, maybe you could just DFA him. They just did that to Michael Givens. So certainly not off the table. Uh, my final answer will have to be to option Mike Bauman. And I know, or maybe it's option Nick Vespi and then option Mike Bauman when D.L. Hall's ready or John Means is ready, Tyler Wells. You know, the relief has been our weakest point, but some of these guys don't deserve to lose their spot. So it's like too much talent for too few spots. It's a good problem to have, but it's, it's a tough one. And the next question is, speaking of left-handed relievers, D.L. Hall 
versus Siano Perez versus Nick Vespi. How does that shake out? I think, like I said, I think let's just say Volth is activated next week or the week after. You could option Vespi for him, and then Dio Hall is ready to come up. Then I think you could DFA Siano Perez or option Mike Bauman, whichever one seems like the best option at the time. But as far as between these three lefties, I go Dio Hall one, his velocity is back. Striking out batters, missing bats. He did give up a couple runs in his last outing, but not too concerned. I think he could be a dominant bullpen arm. Down the stretch from the left side, I would put Vespi ahead of Perez personally, but without an option, Perez will stay on the roster over Vespi. Next question is John Means and Tyler Wells. If they go into the bullpen for the stretch run or the playoffs, then then who goes? And I say, who goes? Who knows? Again, let's just say Voth is back. Uh, D.L. Hall is here. Then you could say Bauman and Vespi are in AAA. As options to still be used, they could still get playing time. Then John Means is ready. Well, I think at that point, that's when a Cielo Perez DFA can come into, come into play because either John Means is going to start games down the stretch and Cole Irv could move to the bullpen or John Means just gets used out of the bullpen as well. So there's another left-hander, whether it's in the rotation or the bullpen, to take Perez's spot. And then say Tyler Wells is ready as well. Man, then then it's a tough choice. Then I think you might see Cole Irvin optioned. I think you could see Cole Irvin optioned at that point, just because he has one. He's already been optioned this year. He has looked really good. But I think you got to maximize your spots. And unless Jacob Webb is going to start struggling again like he did the last month with Anaheim before he was brought up or DF, DFA'd and, and claimed by the Orioles, then then I think that might be the option there. Ben also says, Kyle Gibson is gone next year. So do we extend J- Jack Flaherty? Do we extend Fujinami? Do you extend Kyle Gibson? Definitely no to Gibson for me. I think he played his role as a leader for the, the pitchers, especially in the rotation. Flaherty, I could see it. I think they've made some minor adjustments already that have led to some success and listen to our guy Santiago um, talk about that a little bit on his latest between the numbers. I I could see the Orioles trying to extend Flaherty. I think what there's a five day window after the season ends where you can negotiate with your own guys. I could see them trying to extend him for a two or three year deal if he's willing to, but they're not going to go market value. So he's going to have to love it here and want to reestablish his value because he's still pretty young, 27. If he signs a two-year, three-year deal, he can he can hit free agency again right before or right after he turns 30. Fujinami, I don't know. I mean, I love the stuff, obviously. 102 to 103 with the fastball, a splitter in the low 90s. It's just absolutely ridiculous. But the control, I do think a full year in offseason of working with our pitching coaches would do him really well but at the same time i think he wants to start i wouldn't be surprised if he goes back to japan i think he's going to have options and i'm not sure he's going to lock himself in that fast but that said he also does seem to be fitting in well with this team in this bullpen he was involved with the uh funny mike bauman birthday thing out in the bullpen uh at camden yards a week or so ago one year i would i would sign him for another one year deal before he hits free agency he still has options because even though the the service time rules are different because he came over from Japan, he he's not arbitration eligible and all this stuff. He does have options. So I do think that is an option. <laughs> oh, you see? Uh, so, yeah, we'll see what happens there. Joey Ortiz, Ben says, do you bring him up in favor of Jorge Mateo or Ramon Arias? And it's he notes that Ramon Arias does have an option. I think they'll stick with what's working right now. Mateo, I feel like they're go- basically just from comments you've heard from Brandon Hyde that his speed is useful late in games. I think they want him for the playoffs this year, at least. So I don't think he's going anywhere. I do think they still love Joey Ortiz, but he's also, it's his first year on the 40 man, a lot of team control. You keep him down the rest of the year. You also don't lose a year of 
and then you reevaluate in the off season. But if there's an injury or something, I think he's the guy. He comes up. He can play all three infield positions extremely well, hits the ball incredibly hard. We've been over this. But I think for now, I would obviously love to have Ortiz on the major league team over either of these guys. But I don't think it's going to happen unless there's an injury. Does Connor Norby debut this year? That's an easy one. No, I don't think so unless there's a ton of a rash of injuries or a COVID outbreak or something like that. I, ju- I just don't see it. I'm still a fan of Norby. He's number eight on my personal top prospect list. I think he's got a great bat. His defense seems to be maybe getting a little bit better. You know, he's not going to win any gold gloves out there, but hopefully he could be better than what Adam Frazier's been giving you at second base. But he doesn't need to be added to the 40-man. So I don't think they're in any rush to do that. Next is what happens when Cedric Mahomes and Aaron Hicks return. Can you uh, see that this was one of the questions from last week? I think when Mullins returns, they will option Ryan McKenna down to AAA. So I get points for that, right? And when Aaron Hicks returns, it sounds like he's still an option to return early this coming week in San Diego. I think Colton Kowser is going to get optioned. I do. Unless Austin Hayes is going to get the injured list stint and they'll just swap places but Hayes is starting today on Sunday in center field so I feel like probably not going to happen Colton Kowser is on the bench with Ryan O'Hearn Austin Hayes and Anthony Santander in the outfield against a right-handed pitcher so I just think Kowser is going to go down and maybe he'll be back this year or maybe he'll come into spring training with some major league experience and try to build on it no harm no foul don't think it means anything too negative about him long term if that's what happens but he could come up with the expanded rosters in september or heston kersag could get the shot and then you come into next spring training with both of them having had major league experience tony wants to know when does this team surpass last season's win total trying to remember how many wins we had last year was 85 85 or 87 let me look it up 2022 baltimore orioles Baltimore Orioles, 83, so I was way off. Um, 83, we have 72 at the time of this recording. I will say mm, September 10th, if they play a game. If not, then a day after. So that's my opinion. We clearly will. We have a chance at 100 wins. We have a pretty safe shot at 90. So that's exciting. Who would have saw that coming? When the season started, I think I predicted 87 or 88 wins, and we should easily beat that. Nick wants to know, are there any standout names we should keep an eye on in the FCL and DSL? Any surprises, good or bad? And let me just pull up the rosters so I can talk about this. Obviously, haven't seen any of these guys in person. Just scouting the stat line, basically, with these guys, but... I will tell you who jumped has jumped out to mine so far. I'll start on the pitching side. Carlos Brito is an interesting name. He's a little bit older for DSL, but he's got a .66 ERA over 13 and two-thirds innings. Francisco Morale, he was the big bonus baby from uh, the international signing period that just opened up. He's got an ERA under three with a bunch of strikeouts. He's standing out for sure. Jesus Palacios has been amazing. Um, He's got more strikeouts and innings pitched and ERA under two. So those guys in the DSL, I would say. Also guys who have been promoted from the DSL to the FCL during the season, even if the results (laughs) when they went up to the FCL haven't been particularly great, like Echo Correa, Correa, who has a 7.88 ERA, over 24 innings in the FCL, but he had a 1.69 ERA with 18 strikeouts in less than 11 innings in the DSL. I think the fact that they're willing to promote these guys and challenge them says a lot. I mean, remember, these guys are like really young. Nolan Cuevas, similar thing. He had a 2.17 ERA with 25 strikeouts and 10 walks in 29 innings in the DSL. He's got a 5.06 ERA in the FCL. Miguel Mesa as well. I mean, he's he's holding his own in uh, FCL after getting promoted from the DSL. And Andres Parra, again, these guys, that shows a lot of confidence in what they're able to do by the organization. So I'd say they stand out. And Brian Bautista, another guy who he's started in the FCL, still there. He's got 17.2 innings pitched, 
2.55 ERA, 15 strikeouts, to seven walks. He's an interesting name. Obviously, Luis De Leon, you know by now, but he started in the FCL, and now he's in our top 30 prospects. Brainer Sanchez is also an interesting relief arm who is in Delmarva. On the hitting side, which is probably the more interesting side, at least when you're looking this far ahead, I will go down to the DSL. Obviously, Luis Almeida out for the season with a shoulder injury, but he he showed off the tools. He flashed the tools that made him the biggest signing in Orioles history internationally. Josh Lorenzo, he's batting 214 with an OPS hovering around 700, but he's got five doubles, a triple, and three home runs. He's walking a ton and hitting for power, which when you're 16 years old, that's that's pretty impressive. You know, obviously the hit tool is going to have to come around, but so much time for that. Luis Guevara is an interesting guy who has been walking, stealing bases. He's not hitting for power, but he's got five doubles and a triple, 280, batting average 771 OPS. Last time I updated my, my list, he's standing out to me. Some of the guys like Abraham Cohen and Jose Mejia, who I was excited about coming into the season. have um, Cohen's only got 19 at-bats, Mejia 9, so they're probably dealing with injuries. Not much to go off there. Luis Vicioso, who is Jorge Mateo's cousin, he's performed well. He was the All-Star and All-Star MVP for the Dominican Summer League. He's cooled off a little bit in the second half. He's a little bit older for the competition, but he's got a good bat. And some of the guys who are repeating the level would be Fernando Perguero and Ellis Cuevas. Uh, Peguero has got an OPS over 900, Cuevas an OPS over 850, hitting for average, walking, stealing bases, hitting for a little bit of power, again, repeating the level, so it's not as impressive if, as if this was their, their first season through, but hey, you love to see the development, and Miguel Rodriguez, another catcher who's batting three around 300, OPS over 800, walking, hitting for some doubles, power, Definitely a name to keep in mind for next year. Up in the FCL, Braylon Tavera. I think, you know, he's quietly put a really strong season together. He's got double-digit stolen bases, four home runs, five doubles. He's walking a ton. He's always done that. But in 270 with an 845 OPS last time I updated. Leandro Arias, he's holding his own. He's doing fine. Aaron Estrada missed some time with, with injury. I'm still a big believer in him. Raylan Ramos was having an impressive FCL season after having a really impressive DSL season last year, but he seems to be hurt because he hasn't played in quite some time. Thomas Sosa, he was an outfielder we were excited about last year in the DSL after the international signing period from last year. Didn't do much then, but right now he's, he's hitting really well. He's got an OPS approaching 900, hitting for power, taking walks. Anudis Mordan, another catcher who's got an OPS over 900, definitely showing power. He's got seven home runs on the season. And again, taking walks, that's just what Orioles players are going to do at this point. And the last guy I want to shout out is Christian Benavides, just because it's really interesting the trajectory he's had last year in the DSL and this year in the FCL. He's still only 18 years old. He's an infielder, and he's a young 18 too. Last year, he ended up hitting 295 with a 786 OPS in the DSL. But he got off to an incredibly slow start where he betted 179 with a 532 OPS over his first 50 plate appearances or so. And then he turned it on in the second half and was a name that just jumped on my radar. So this year I'm coming in thinking, yeah, definitely keep an eye on him. Well, guess what? He had an incredibly so slow start again. But he has also been picking it up in the second half, getting more playing time, getting more hits. So clearly, still plenty of room to grow, plenty of room to grow. But he's got his average up to 206. And I'm telling you, it was like under 100 for a long time uh, with a 627 OPS. He's got two home runs, two doubles, three stolen bases. So I think he's still a guy to keep an eye on as well. Long story short. Bill Evans wants to know, will the 2024 reduction of the domestic little minor league roster from 185 to 165 change anything of note? I mean, maybe, uh, especially for a team that's as deep, not just like at the upper end of our top 50 prospect list. I do a top 100 and all these guys 
I could see a scenario where they are helping a team in majors at some point in their careers. Yeah, I think it, it could hurt a team like the Orioles who are so deep. But if you do take, what, four players off of each roster, I mean, it shouldn't hurt too much, but it, it hurts with the, the guys you take a flyer on or you're not going to be able to, like, in Delmar, but Randy Barrett, he's got like a 15 ERA all season long. He's been in their bullpen just because he's, he's a guy that will come in and if you need someone to just eat the innings and results be damned, there you go. If you take away a couple of roster spots, a guy like that might not be available to you. And then you have to push pitch players when you weren't expecting to. A guy like Joseph Versa, who's just signed off the street and has really helped the depth at AAA and AA this year. Maybe you, you're unable to do that and you just got to roll with what you have. Maybe you're going to have to cut someone that you didn't want to because you need to fill a position. I don't know. I think it could affect, but hopefully not too much. And always I'm not going to be happy when just jobs are taken away from these guys who, who have a dream. Bobby Jones wants to know what's going on with Billy Cook. <laughs> he's cooking. He's Billy Chef now. Didn't you know? Um, no, he's been fantastic. I think he's just been another one of these guys that's just like a box of tools and hasn't really put it all together. Uh, obviously, he showed flashes because in Delmarva, he had a three-hermer game the same year he was drafted. He's got power. He's got speed. It doesn't look pretty. It's an ugly swing. Everything he does is not very aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing, but it gets the job done. And, and yeah, he's he's been consistent. If you take out April of this year, he's been very consistently good. Um, don't sleep on him. Simkin wants to know, every MLB uses platoons for lineups and pinch hitting. Why do commenters not understand this? When they send up Adam Frazier to bat against right-handed pitcher, or they start Mateo McKenna against left-handed pitchers while sitting Cowser, Stowers, etc. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, look, fandom is fandom. They're going to freak out about every little thing. Everything's a punt lineup. If if it's not the exact lineup you wanted to see when you woke up that morning, it's a punt lineup. Oh my God, what are they doing? Clearly, look, and it's not to say that it's not worth questioning. Like clearly. No one's going to be perfect, but these guys are looking at all the splits, all the whatever. They're working, Hyde's working together with the front office to put these lineups, and and you don't know who could be banged up, who has a cold and is just not feeling great, you know, little things like that. But yeah, I mean, I'm fine with the platooning for the most part. I mean, guys like Adley and Gunner. I mean, Gunner was even platooning a little bit in the beginning of the year before he heated up, but yeah, these guys should be playing every day. Holiday will probably be a guy that plays every day. Most of our prospects, big prospects coming up should be because Kerstad hits lefties really well. Westberg, like for the most part, I think these guys deserve to play every day and, and get most of the at-bats, but I have no problem with the platooning. It's also a, a sneaky way to get guys a little more rest. Like just say, for instance, Gunner didn't start last night against George Kirby, but Hyde said he'll probably be in this game at some point. Well, that's a chance to... Give him a little bit of a breather. He did come in. He pinch hit. Played a little bit of the field late in the game. But he didn't have to play all nine innings. So maybe that, that saves some legs later in the season when you're a playoff contending team like the Orioles are this year. I, I do think that the lineup nitpicking is out of control. And it's very annoying. But at the same time, you're a fan. I get it. You want to see the players you want to see play. But I think they're doing it for a reason. And it's honestly, it's been working. It's been working, even though it is weird that like, Ramon Arias starts against most lefties when he's a reverse splits guy. Stuff like that, I'm not sure I understand completely, but but I, I don't hate what they've done with the lineups and all that stuff. Justin Daly wants to know, do you think since Kowser's not getting playing time, he should be sent back down? And with how poor he's playing of late and us being in the midst of a playoff run, do you think he's optioned when Hicks and Mullins are back? Well, Mullins is back and he's still around. And like I was saying before, I do think he's going to be optioned when Hicks comes back just because, and look, He's getting valuable experience right now with the major league coaches behind the scenes. I know for a fact that if you read Asher Ball and, and just the stuff that the people in this front office have historically shown that they do believe you can get something out of being on the major league team and not playing every day and working behind the scenes. And they think that's valuable. And, and I'm sure he's getting that experience. He came in pinch hitting late in the game a week or two ago and just really barreled up a double to the gap. I think he's looked better. He walked twice last night. 
But I think it's more of a confidence thing, honestly. He just needs to get comfortable and confident to be able to play at the major league level. And we're getting down to the to the <laughs> to the end of the line when it comes to this divisional race and and playoff hunt. So I, I do think he's going to be optioned, and I think he will be a guy who takes the experience and innerly makes himself better based upon it. And I think he'll come into spring training confident and ready to win a starting job in the 2024 season. And the last question I have is from David Adams, of course. Preview the San Diego and Oakland series, because, sorry, I missed the preview Houston and Seattle series. I'll say uh, we sneak in a game to win one out of three against Houston and not get swept for the 76th time. And then I think, you know, Seattle – We'll probably get beat pretty bad in the first game. We'll win a squeaker that we probably deserve to lose the second game. And and the third game's up in the air uh, because it's about to be played in about an hour. <laughs> um, but, yeah, San Diego, good team. Obviously a lot of talent, not the best record. Um, they haven't played up to their potential, and that's for a couple, a couple years now. The Orioles are going to face Hugh Darvish Monday in San Diego. Obviously, you know... He's a good pitcher. We beat him in our um, 2012 play-in game or wild card game, one game playoff against Texas, and we beat him with Joe Saunders on the hill. Let's see if we can beat him. He's 37 now. Got an ERA a little bit over four. Not as intimidating as he used to be, but clearly still a good pitcher we'll have to face. Then we'll face Michael Waka on Tuesday. Guy we showed a lot of interest in, according to twitter and the journalists out there coming into the season so we'll get to face him not particularly intimidated by him and then blake snell a guy who a lot of people would have liked to seen us go out and trade for at the deadline myself included obviously played a lot with tampa bay so should be some kind of experience here tough lefty just gotta hope he's waking up that day and not having his command because that's the one thing that we could say he's like a Five and dive guy because he's he's got amazing stuff. Doesn't always control it great. So hopefully, you know, he just gets his pitch count up really fast. He can maybe land a blow or two against him, work some at bats, walk, maybe hit a homer, get him out fourth or fifth inning, and try to go to work on their bullpen, which is pretty good as well. You got Josh Hader in the closer role, another guy I would have liked to try to trade for, but they decided they were gonna go for it, so they didn't move him or Snell. They have guys like Robert Suarez, Nick Martinez, Scott Barlow they traded for. And other than that, it's not not anything too too great to write home about. But if you're going to get to them, I think it would probably be in the bullpen, but obviously not against Josh Hader, maybe not the back end. That middle relief, look, Orioles fans think our middle relief has struggled. It's it's a pandemic in baseball. Middle relief is not not particularly good anywhere. In the lineup, I mean, obviously you got Fernando Tatis Jr., Manny Machado, or should I say uh, a third baseman with the number 13, uh, since we're not allowed to talk about former Orioles. Juan Soto, one of the best players in the world, still not even 25 years old, is is right there in left field for them. Xander Bogarts, Drake, Jake Cronenworth, Gary Sanchez, Trent Grisham, Ha Seong Kim, G-Man Choi they just traded for, Garrett Cooper, Matt Carpenter, they're a really solid team, but I'd like to think just our our vibes, our aura, will we'll, we'll let us win two out of three against them. And then Oakland, obviously, we played them early in the season, took two of three, I want to say, or three of four, even though it seemed like we struggled a little bit more than that against them. They're even worse now. I feel like seasons in this August grind, it's a month and a half left for them. They have to be looking forward to the off season, I, ju- I just think we should bare minimum win two out of three against them. They have J.P. Sears, Freddie Tarnock, Paul Blackburn, Luis Medina, and Ken Waldenchuk in the rotation. If you saw Luis Medina, just field, <laughs> make a nice play, field a ground ball back up the middle as the pitcher, just like walk over to first base and get beat by the runner. Like what? What are you doing? The focus in, is just not there. They have Trevor May. It's probably the headliner in their. In their bullpen. He's their closer at the moment. J.J. Blade, Zach Geloff, Brent Rooker, Seth Brown, Jordan Diaz, Tyler Soderstrom, Lawrence Butler, Shea Langoliers, Nick Allen, Story Ruiz. You got Adamus Diaz, Jonah Bride, Cody Thomas. <laughs> Just a lot of like uh, creative characters here. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, you got to win two out of three at bare minimum. It would be great to sweep them and just just put your foot down on them and, and finish it off. If you can, it would be nice for uh, our chances at the division. But yeah, that's pretty much it for me this week. Always enjoy doing these mailbags. You know, life's been crazy since the baby's been here. So apologies for missing last week. Like I said, I had a power outage, but I, I enjoy doing these. And hopefully you enjoyed listening. Love to answer any and all questions that anyone has. It doesn't even have to be about baseball. So either Zach or Nick will be back next week to do another one of these Major League mailbags. And hey, we're getting down to the wire. We have a live show coming up October 2nd. That would be the day after the season ends, I believe. So listen to on the main show to uh, get some more details on that, on where it is. It's right near the stadium. So we'd love to see as many people out there as possible. Zach, I'm sure, will give a better job detailing that uh, on Monday night. And anyway, thank you for listening, and I'll talk to you next time. That'll do it for this week's episode of On The Verge. Be sure to check out our Patreon page where you can help show your support for the show and get bonus content, including monthly top 50 updates to our prospect list and daily game recaps during the season and much, much more. For the ones who get it done, the most important part is the one you need now. And the best partner is the one who can deliver. That's why millions of maintenance and repair pros trust Granger because we have professional-grade supplies for every industry, even hard-to-find products. And we have same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders. But most importantly, we have an unwavering commitment to help keep you up and running. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.